In fact, uh, two volunteers can come on the stage. Anybody who is interested in seeing it closely, two persons can come on the stage. One, you are two senior. We want junior people. No, 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 no. Sorry, the junior lots at the back. Aaj, come, come, come. That small girl. Yeah. Come, 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 come. I don't know. You may be a senior resident, but you are small for me. Come. Come. So, Come, come, come. So, Can we begin? Are we waiting for some more people to come? Dr. Archana said, 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 I think all of you come in the front. Don't sit back. Or walk past me. Come, come, come. Shed your inhibitions. So, uh, in the next few minutes, uh, uh, Dr. Ishwar, uh, myself, and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Paneet, and uh, our two, uh, you're not volunteers, you're there to help us out. We need learn, we learn from so much from anesthetists and intensivists. So, we will be demonstrating uh, how to do a proper brainstem uh, death evaluation and conduct of the apnea test. As we have uh, said before, the first and the foremost important thing is the patient has to be in irreversible coma. He should be unconscious. That is point number one. If we talk about more uh, extensive definition, we use the word Glasgow Coma Score. So the, the Glasgow That's Coma Score of the person should be 3 by 15. Okay, sure. he should be in coma. And when I say the word irreversible, it means he should have evidence of irreversible damage on the CT scan. That can be very well read by the uh, by the concerned person. It could be a neurosurgeon, it could be a radiologist of a department. So those two things have to be there. So as we, as we said in the lecture, it has to be coma plus apnea. That means he's on uh, some ventilatory support. So like this uh, gentleman, he is right now he is intubated. And he's on ventilator support. You should look at the parameters there. Uh, I don't have a pointer, uh, but uh, his parameters are blood pressure is 90 by 60, uh, 90 is the systolic, 60 is the diastolic, and mean is 70. You should also look at the respiratory rate. It is showing as 16, 1, 6. But on this uh, monitor, you see, the ventilator is giving you 12 uh, per minute as a respiratory drive. So there's a discrepancy of 4. He is hypotensive. And there is some mismatch. And also, I think, uh, what's the temperature like, Pani? So, temperature is? Peripheral is 36.1. So, first of all, Dr. Pani uh, and Dr. Uh, Ishwar, can you please uh, demonstrate all the brainstem reflexes, please? So, once you once you're convinced that a patient has irreversible coma, and the patient is on ventilator, you run the checklist, like he does not have any metabolic issues. He is not on any depressant drugs. His temperature is normal. Okay, all these things are, are you, have, you have run through this checklist. And then the next thing is to subject the patient to a series of neurological tests. The first neurological test is, of course, the common thing that we do in all certifications that is the pupillary reflex. You open the upper eyelid and dim the lights. You, you, no, no, you do the you dim the lights of the ICU um, chamber and pull the upper eyelid up and shine the torch on one side. At least I do it about three times to confirm slowly and steadily, and then close and then look for uh, any consensual reaction on the other eye. That is on one side, the other side reacts, and then do the same thing. Repeat the same thing on the other side. I usually do it three times on either sides so that. We are sure that the pupils are dilated and fixed. Okay, that is the first neurology test. The second test, of course, is the conjunctival and corneal reflex, which is actually you take a wisp of cotton and if the eye is sometimes the eye may be closed, so you may have to kind of in, in official neurology testing, you're not supposed to do that, but in a comatose patient, you may have to do that. You open the eyelid, bring the wisp of cotton from the sides. That's the conjunctiva and cornea. The efferent reflex is in the form of blinking. Okay. 
and do it on one side on the conjunctiva as well as the cornea and then go back on the other to the other side and repeat the same back in when i was doing my mbbs if i stand on the wrong side professor used to fail as an examination <laughs> okay you come from the side touch and take it out it should not be a constant touch that the eye get used to it. so just touch and take it out that's enough so that will be the second uh, clinical test that you have to perform on the patient the third test again is con 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 uh, is again you know related to the eye and that is the doll side movement so before you do the doll side movement you have to ensure that there is no neck fractures many of these patients are victims of road traffic accidents so there is no cervical fracture you have to look at the x ray and see that there is no cervical fracture and then you hold the eyes up eyelids up gently rotate the neck the there is the head to one side and then to the opposite side again to one side and then to the opposite side and then to this one side and opposite side i do that about 5 to 10 times and what do we look for we look for the movement of the conjunctiva cornea to opposite side when we move to this one to right side it moves to the left side and when you move to the left side it moves to the right side it uh, may tells you about the integrity of the brain stem reflexes and sometimes as i said you know uh, it's always most uh, advisable to hold the endotracheal tube uh, with our hand yeah okay that because that so easy. many times it so happens uh, the tube can come out while you're doing the dose side movement and uh, you know it's a polytrauma patient it may not be so easy i'm i'm, I'm sure uh, our pd anesthesia will have uh, some stories to share with us it's not easy to intubate uh, each and every patient especially more so in the icu okay so always uh, keep your hand uh, and protect the endotracheal tube uh, when you're moving and doing the dose side movement continue that's a very important take home message from deepak if the like <coughs> either tracheal tube comes out you are in mms okay now the no only this side to side at the cryocephalic reflex so the next uh, test that you have to do is actually the <coughs> gag reflex so I'm, i'm sure you must have performed your gag reflex in your in your uh, uh, in your final year mbbs examination and after that if you are taking neurology then you have to do it again and again so the gag reflex is very simple you have to use two tongue depressors uh, many in my our part of the world we use the tongue depressors made of wood disposable tongue depressors which are available everywhere we take with one tongue depressor depress the tongue down okay when you're doing this you ask one of the other staff to shine a torch to the posterior pharyngeal wall and then gently introduce to make sure that you don't hurt any other part use a gen you know use the a soft tube to touch the posterior pharyngeal wall sometimes i use the tongue depressor itself to touch the posterior pharyngeal wall so the gag reflex is actually an elevation of the palatal arch when I mean, which can be witnessed through uh, the mouth itself with this torch shown on it and you have to do it on both the sides both sides yeah so it's very important all the tests the pupillary response uh, the corneal response the dose side movement i mean of course it's kind of neutral event but uh, the cup reflex the gag reflex every event if it is bilaterally representative you have to do it on the both the sides in case in case you get response only on one side and you don't get response on the other side or say for example uh, the other side the patient is having anophthalmos there is some pupillary damage you have to ideal circumstances resort to ancillary tests so you should be doing response on both the sides i'll, I'll just give you a case scenario the patient comes with a facial max injury and he has got a third of palsy as a result of that so there you cannot do the tubular reflex because the tubular reflex will be absent so there you don't write a tubular reflex but there are times when people are certified without actually doing it and you get caught don't do that so write that it is not be certified because of third of palsy pre existing third of palsy you can do it on the normal side on the other way and also look for the consensual reflex on the other side okay and in those cases you can always rely on ancillary tests to confirm that brain that has happened so uh, <clears throat> i think so you might be having a doubt that with ct tube patient might be having a small mouth opening you might not be able to appreciate all these signs then what what is the answer for them sir 
No, the, uh, usually we push the ET tube to one side, it is past the rear to the side. The tongue depressor is introduced from the opposite side, contralateral side, and then the tongue is depressed there. But then the, there are, the trouble happens when you have an injury which makes the tongue swollen up. You will not be able to visualize the posterior pharyngeal wall. In which case, don't try to push blindly because you will cause bleeding, which is not actually, which is disrespectful of the, the person who is lying there. We even do cuff reflex with the help of can you, ET can, you, can you show us how to do the cuff reflex? Yes, sir. The cuff dip, I usually do the cuff reflex when we discuss it for the apnea test. So what you do, is you, you know, you, you when you you disconnect the ventilator and introduce the you, the, the oxygen should be connected and it should be flowing at six liters per minute and then it should be gently introduced under sterile precautions right up to where it stops. Don't push too much because you will be injuring a part of the lung. And then as Dr. Rahul Pandit said, sometimes what happens is the air gets trapped in there, it won't come out and it can cause pneumothorax. So gently and then move up and down so that the trachea gets stimulated and the cough reflex can be elicited. So if the patient is brain dead, there will be no cough reflex at the end of your test. Okay, this can be done when the ventilator, when the ET tube is being disconnected or apnea test. So the cranial nerves are the common. So if you are not able to do a GAD test, yeah, you go for it. Okay. Motor, motor, uh, okay. Yeah. Now, the next one is of course the response to pain You want to demonstrate that? Go ahead and demonstrate. So when you are trying to give a painful stimulus, the painful stimulus has to be given. One is a central stimulus. The second is a peripheral stimulus. So what you do routinely is you give a supraorbital pinch, okay, as a part of the central stimulus. So I think so. Uh, old professors you usually also try to give a jaw thrust or jaw pressure to as a part of a central stimulus. And the peripheral stimulus and the another stim central stimulus you give would be a shoulder pinch. So you take the shoulder into your hands in between your thumb and the index finger and you give con con constantly increasing pressure for the 10 seconds so you will observe you should keep the patient completely open you should be able to see all the lay fingers limbs very clearly to see any movement and if there is any movement you should acknowledge the movement and then think about whether it is a proper response or is it a spinal reflex is it consistent or is it uh, inconsistent and then take a decision whether it is a real response or a spinal reflex which we are calling as a Lazarus sign. And then coming to the peripheral response, you can take your pen doing uh, other thing. Yeah, so you just have to press it for 10 seconds. Okay. I mean, you try to do it. I mean, you catch all of a wonderful friend sitting next to you. Take a pen. Oh, no, your friend also. Take a pen. Press it on the nail bed, press it for 10 seconds as hard as you can. Trust me, this is the most painful stimuli you can ever sustain or give it to a second person. So in an unconscious patient, whenever we are looking for elicitation of the motor response, the peripheral response, this is what is recommended. Many times you must have seen the busy ICU, you know, the nipples of the ladies being damaged, the, the ear, you know, the, the most common place people use the ear and they just keep on eliciting for the response, which is not to be done. Uh, temporomandibular joint is another area which you, where you can give a central stimuli. Temporomandibular joint, holding between the platysma, thumb and the index finger, not with the nails. Thumb and the index finger, platysma. Again, you try to pinch yourself and see it's very, very painful. Okay. And then is the peripheral responses in the limbs. Mind you, when you're doing the peripheral response, then you may get a Lazarus sign in some patients. So many times it so happens uh, when the patient is actually brain dead, and uh, your anesthesia colleague is trying to put in an arterial line, arterial line or any peripheral venous sign, and suddenly there, there will be triple response. There will be some uh, abduction at the high flexion at the knee joint and some movement at the uh, the feet. It is absolutely normal. It's a spinal reflex. It is not a. Uh, whenever you give a cranial uh, uh, stimulation and then you get a motor movement, yes, the person is having an intact brain cell. Basically, the idea of doing all these tests is to be very sure that the person is not having any brainstem activity. So all the reflexes which have their epicenter in the brainstem, midbrain, bones, medulla, they need to be tested. And this is what we are testing uh, from the midbrain level when you're looking for the eye responses, bones, when you're looking for the facial cremates, 
we have to look for the spatial premiums also and the motor responses. So next, uh, once we are done, the, th the thing which should never ever be missed is the uh, cold calorie response. Okay. For that, what we do is uh, we take uh, ice cold. We ask the nurse to put the uh, kind of a normal saline bottle in the, in the fridge and it should be at a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius. Uh, conventionally, we take uh, 30 cc of uh, ice cold saline to be inserted in both the ears one at a time. Once you do it, you wait for one minute for the uh, any nystagmoid movement to be there. Then you wait for several minutes between the two tests. Like let us say I do on the right ear. Okay, once I've instilled the saline slowly over 30 seconds, I should wait for one minute to check for the nystagmoid movements. And usually it is so difficult to appreciate those movements. So what we look is the movement of the eyes, eyeballs. So it is like the side where you uh, put in the cold saline, you should be getting an eye movement on the same side. If that movement is not there, that means the person is likely to be brain dead. Okay. Word of caution. Before you do the calorie test is to check for the eardrum. Tympanic number. It should be intact. If there is a perforation there, don't go ahead with the calorie test. Okay. Now we come to that. Yeah. Okay. So are there, are there any questions so far? Yeah. These are, are the questions? simple neurological tests. No, 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 never, 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 never. Yeah, we try to do the TOF before. Never, ever. The person you must. So it is called as a checklist for the prerequisites. There are few prerequisites for the apnea test. Like this gentleman, I will never, ever do the apnea test. Okay. His blood pressure is still 90 by 60. Huh? And he's still, uh, what else? I think the rest of the parameters are in place. Saturation is maintained. The rest of things are in place. So I'll try to pick up the blood pressure. Though above 90, uh, you can do it, but usually we take it as 100 systolic, you know, that, that's the time we should do it. So to repeat again, you have to go from the top to the bottom, easy way to remember. So in the eyes, you have to look for the pupillary response, both the sides, right side, left side. Next, you look for the corneal and the conjunctival response on both the sides. Next, you look for the dull side movement. Okay. Next, you look for the cold calorie response. Then you look for the motor response. Okay, motor response to the central stimulation that is supraorbital, temporomandibular, and maybe in the trapezius. Okay, peripheral, all four limbs you have to test one by one, each of them, and document. If you look at the the, the form uh, which is there for the for the brainstem death certification, you will see a list of all the tests which are mentioned. Each of the tests has to be ticked, done or not done, and what is the response? You cannot miss out even a single. The paperwork has to be complete in brainstem death certification. Anything which you miss can uh, really mess up the entire program. Okay. Can I say something about Please. Lazarus thing? Please. Well, this is a story from the Bible. You know, uh, Lazarus was actually a person living in a part of the world called as Pepin. He was affected with some strange disease and uh, his sisters, Mary and Martha, prayed that he, his life may be restored. But unfortunately, he died. And uh, Jesus Christ was passing through Bethany when his sister went and begged him that to give back my brother's life. And uh, Jesus Christ did something magical and Lazarus sprang back into life. Okay, now there are two things in, about Lazarus in medical jargon. One is the Lazarus sign and the other is Lazarus phenomenon. The Lazarus sign is actually it's like flinging movement of the upper torso as well as the hands across the body when you are giving a stimulus or even without a stimulus at times. Hmm? You're going to demonstrate. No, no, okay. as if you, no you just give any stimuli in the, any of the limbs and suddenly there will be some uh, flexion at the knee joint and some uh, uh, flexion at the hip joint and some sudden jerky movement will be there. But they are usually not sustained. Let me tell you that. Uh, all these reflexes which you elicit once or twice, they may not be sustained. Okay. Go. Fine. So, the Lazarus phenomenon is actually an automatic uh, uh, you know, restart of the heart following a failed cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So, that is Lazarus phenomenon. Again, springing back of cardiac action has to be a stopped resuscitation. So, the Lazarus sign is a sure sign that the patient is brain dead. You know, there should not be any confusion about it. Hmm? I don't know much about Lazarus phenomenon. 
that is a critical care people there it's only a you know a term used for you know it comes back but it is sustained or not it usually it's usually we give up the research station because it has been there for long but for some reason the heart kicks back self back and back but by that time the brain will be dead yes Is you want to answer that? No. So basically, the the moments which you get on a peripheral stimulation, as I told you, the if you look at this the and the signs which you will get, you will not get a sustained repetitive response. Sustained repetitive response. In case the person is having an intact brainstem activity, I give a painful stimuli, and the, so each time I give the response, there will be. a uh, reflex movement of the extremity that is number 1 and number 2 it will get extinguished over a period of time number 3 there will not be any movement on the central painful stimuli so in case a person is having a movement of the limb on a central painful stimuli that means the person is having a intact brain stem reflex activity the the reason of doing uh, this uh, peripheral stimuli on each and every limb is just to add to one of the documentation but at the end of the day you have to look for the central stimuli central painful stimuli has to be given to the patient i have one video of a child in my presentation i don't know if you were present that i can show you so one video of a child and this, this child had a lazarus sign and in that child i had to to you know give a strong message to my icu team i was very much convinced but then but just because i speak loud and i am convinced that is not the end of the uh, story so for that i did the ct angiogram to document absence of cerebral blood flow and then we went at with the organ donation yes yeah it is not so common let me tell you it is not so that uh, the the lazarus sign will be present in 100% of the patients huh? the patients who have been on prolonged ventilatory support for many many days in those patients it is more likely to be present you want to add so uh, when we started we said that we have a diagnosis of irreversible brain injury so whenever we start our work on brain death certification we know the diagnosis of the patient this patient is of severe traumatic brain injury we have a imaging which is suggestive of brain death all the gyri sulci will be lost all the systems are closed and there is a start that is a starting point for our working so in neurology whatever we interpret we interpret depending upon the clinical situation and scenario so we say that uh, sometimes it happens even with a breeze of air patient will have a significant motor response which can be read as m4 m5 but we are all we are also taking all the scenarios into condition patient is hypotensive patient is having polyuric patient is having absent of other absent brain stem reflexes or absent so consequently we read it as lazarus and it is as sir said it is not consistent and you need to repeat all those responses in each and every limb it should be consistent and it should be reproducible then only you call it as a response otherwise we consider it as a lazarus sign i have written a beautiful paper on lazarus sign i think if uh, dr arjuna has got in, uh, kind of uh, details of each and every member in the whatsapp group you could send that just on the lazarus sign you know the 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 the, the, the fallacies and the pitfalls i have enumerated out in a word format easily understandable and that will answer all your doubts i'll share it with you Yeah. Okay. I think if you go to a few the crematorium and watch uh, bodies being burned, if you have in Banaras or where you, yes. you go to the Chashtra Veda Ghat and Raja Harishchandra Ghat, you'll find that people are beating the bodies down when the funeral pyre is burned. That is a final reflex of the body trying to kind of flex and get out of the funeral pyre. I'm sure people who are not unhappy watching it can go and watch. <laughs> that is a sign of uh, you know it's not that springing this body is springing back in life. but it's just a final reflex in action
All right. So I think <clears throat> once we are done with this, <clears throat> then uh, then we need to do the apnea test. For apnea test, it's always advisable to have at least two persons, uh, preferably from two different specialties. One could be a neurosurgeon, neurologist. Second person could be an intensivist or a critical care person. Form a team of two persons for two different views. <coughs> Excuse me. Check all the prerequisites. What are those? Patient should not be hypotensive. Patient should not be hypothermic. Temperature should be more than 35 degrees Celsius. Patient should not, should not be in any hypovolemia. And when do we say hypovolemia? If the, unit, if the intake output is on a positive balance in the last six hours, if the intake output is more in the positive balance in the last six hours, we by and large say the patient is not hypovolemia. Other criteria could be you could look at the CVP and this and that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so once you're done with that, check everything. This patient is suitable for apnea test. Then you must need to, you need to check everything. You have to do a baseline arterial blood test. All patients who are going, who are going to undergo apnea test, they should have a nice arterial line in place, preferably, preferably in a femoral artery. The reason being, we need to repeat the uh, ABG sampling very frequently, three, four times or maybe multiple times. So it's always better to have it in a larger artery. So I always request our anesthetists to put it in the femoral artery. Am I correct? So they should have a central line in place. They should have an arterial line in place. So you take an arterial blood gas and you check for each and every parameter. The PO2, the PCO2. If the PCO2 is in the lower side, let's say one case was shown in the morning, PCO2 was 26. I will never do that. What I will do is I will just decrease the respiratory rate. Okay. I will decrease the respiratory rate and repeat my arterial blood gas after half an hour and see what is happening to the PCO2. Let the, if you begin the test at a higher PCO2 baseline, your chances of getting the rise in the PCO2, that 4 millimeter you talk about, are much more stronger. Always remember that. A person who begins the test at a PCO2 of 25, you may not get a 60 magical figure in those next uh, 20, uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But if you begin the test at a higher PCO2, you're likely to get the result more early. The, the, the entire story revolves around getting the result out there. PCO2, PO2, pH should be more than 7.2. Okay, these are the three important things you have to see, and also the saturation. Then we prepare the patient for the apnea test. Normal scenario: the most common mistake people do is when they are doing the apnea test, they are looking like this at the monitor. They are not looking at the patient chest. It may so happen that the patient is having a spontaneous respiration when you have disconnected. That thing should never be missed. <clears throat> so if you see. We have taken the liberty to expose the catheter, expose the chest. Okay. And before the test, you need to pre oxygenate the person by 100% oxygen at least for 10 minutes. Okay. So the idea is to have a nice uh, oxygen reserve of the lungs. You pre oxygenate the person and then what is? So Paneet, can you tell us how do we decide what length do we have to put in? How much deep we should go inside? Can you tell us? So, so ideally, it has, ideally it is said that the tip of the catheter should be at the level of carina so that both the lungs are getting oxygenated. And now we are doing this to prevent hypoxia. Okay. So, uh, we want to maintain uh, oxygen levels in the alveoli, so we don't want to get into one of the um, bronchus. So, we want to, in adults, we want to keep it at the level of 24. So, when you pass the suction catheter, so at the angle of mouth, when you, when, when you can see the 24 mark, you stop it and don't proceed further and at that point of time, you leave the catheter there. So, in the team, one would be taking the timer. One would be taking the ABG. We have the basic baseline ABG, and now we have a timer on. Then we disconnect the ventilator. We put the catheter at the level of carina with six liter, four to six liters of flow. And if my intensivist and myself we are around, I would ask my intensivist or myself. One would be seeing at the monitor to see for any desaturation or hypotension, and I would be looking at the. Uh, respiration effort you can also see the respiration movement in the um, monitor but what you see you, you need to expose the abdomen and chest it can be abdominal breathing there can be chest rise so only thing you would do, that would be prominently seen is 
uh, heart which is pulse, uh, beating rest of the thing will be almost neutral if you want to observe very fine movements you should be very keenly observing the chest and thorax flat to the surface for any movement and you we need to be we usually see that at 8 minutes or so we get a positive test but we need we repeat we should repeat abg and we should try to maintain the patient till 10 minutes and repeat a abg then connect back the circuit compare the both the abgs if the abg pco2 level is raised if, the, if there is a raise of 20 mm or if there is <coughs> or is the and value is more than 60 then we consider this test as apnea apnea positive but apnea positive is not abg which is but we have there there are no movements documented during this examination and we have stimulated the brain to such an extent of at a higher pco2s also the medullary center is not stimulable so this patient we consider as apnea death apnea positive along with the this coma severe Coma, um, deep severe coma, which is we also call it as M1 status, absent brain stem reflexes, and positive apnea test conclude to a clinical diagnosis of brain stem death. So uh, hypercarbia, you know why we are doing this test is because we all know that hypercarbia is one of the strongest stimulant to the respiratory tract. That's the whole idea of doing this test. Okay, Dr. Ishwar. uh i am doing the apnea test and all of a sudden i see that the blood pressure is falling and the saturation is fallen to 85 what do i do yeah, there are three situations where you have to abort an apnea test one is when there is a precipitous fall in the blood pressure and second is the fall in saturation and third is of course the okay, an yes. arrhythmia if an arrhythmia is detected on the monitor stop the apnea test reconnect to the ventilator and start the resuscitation procedure that's one reason why i always keep the intensivist next to me as the panic said earlier when you are doing the apnea test so there can be all these three problems you can have a hypotension you can have arrhythmias you can have a fall in saturation now one of the problems which i have witnessed during uh, the conduct of an apnea test is uh, you are putting a patient on an air bed with a pump in the air bed keeps kind of shaking the patient this often gets reflected as a false respiratory effort in the monitor so when you are doing the apnea test the simple advice it is not found in the textbook okay. is switch off the air bed the pump of the air bed so that the bed does not vibrate i hope you know what is talking when you talking about the ripple bed you know Alphabet. we have the ripple bed in the icu where the most of this polytrauma patients are kept there are some reverberations vibrations in the in the bedding to prevent the bed sores so this is what you are talking about yes, am i correct So, so when do you repeat the test? Let us say you aborted the test. Yeah. Once the patient is stable, I will wait for half to twenty to thirty minutes and do that. But if you think that you cannot proceed further with the apnea test, it is wiser to go for an apnea test. Ancillary test. Excellent. So, uh, apnea test is positive. So then, do you approach the family and tell them about the apnea test, or what do you do? In Kerala, what we do is uh, we, there is a general counselling in the patient's family, saying that the first round of brain stem the flexus as well as the apnea test has been done and the patient has been found to be reversibly brain dead and so this message is usually given and that is the point when the grief counselors take over and talk to them about the counseling process so once you are done with this then you have to wait for 6 year 6 hour period and after 6 hour one yes. second let me just complete and then i'll take a brief portion then after 6 hours you have to repeat the same test and repeat the apnea test if the second apnea test is also positive that means uh the pco2 rise of more than 60 or more than 20 fit more than 20 rise than the baseline and there is no spontaneous respiration then you say second apnea positive and that is the time what you have on the abg report let us say my abg at 932 pm shows pco2 of 60 and there is no respiration so that is the time of official declaration of brain death so the time of death is actually <coughs> the point at which the second apnea test has been conducted and uh, the pco2 result is available at our hand yeah it's very important yes please we usually uh, aim for minimum of po2 of more than 200 that is the whole idea of uh, giving 100% oxygen to the patient you understand 
So normally if you look at the ABG parameters, it's 300, 400, 450, it doesn't matter. So, So the, you know, if, if, you have if, an active infection, if you have an active infection, infection, you will not even do the candidate is totally out of the organ donation program. We are talking about the candidates who don't have ARDS picture, yeah. correct? So you have to have a uh, culture. You know, you are talking about a scenario of known traumatic scenario, like let us say stroke patients. So there are so many times uh, you do these tests uh, when this person is on ECMO. Okay, many of these patients are on uh, veno-venous ECMO support also. In those cases, uh, you have to uh, look for the different set of guidelines. And whenever in doubt, you always have an ancillary test to support you. So apnea tests can be done even in the patients who are, for the lung pathology, you put them on veno-venous bypass. And for the uh, heart pathology, you put them on veno-arterial bypass. So they are, they are, you can do it even with those pathologies. But then you need to have a person uh, dealing with the ECMO machine day in and day out to be able to support you back. It's not document. It's not mentioned anywhere in the books. So the only thing I would say is that it's, uh, you know we should always the idea is to the lungs should not be compromised by the test which you are doing. What we are looking at is the rise in the PCO2 because that is the respiratory stimulant. We are creating a respiratory stimulant by you know we are checking that the PCO2 is rising and there is no respiration. But the idea of keeping a higher PO2, the higher PO2 is only so as to prevent any further damage to the lungs. Yeah, there are no gold or growth telling you that you should do this or you should not do it. This is a clinical judgment that you have to make. When a person has significant lung damage, you anticipate that the apnea test may not, may not run smoothly as you expect it. Then you should not be going ahead with the apnea test. That is when you have the uh, non-clinical testing like the CT angiogram or the digital subtraction angiogram or the intracranial Doppler or uh, an EEG. Of course, all have its own fallacies. So you are the best judge to say whether you should proceed with an apnea test or not. Because many a times, you know, there can be a lot of violent hemodynamic changes when you do that. Before I put earlier, uh, one of the presentations says you should measure the core temperature. The best way to measure core temperature is to But most of the general ICUs, all centers will not have that. Rectal temperature you can measure. It's easy. Rectal temperature. Yeah. Even the tympanic membrane, uh, we have the tympanic membrane thermometers during the COVID times, we purchased so many with us. So the, we have the tympanic membrane thermometers in ICU that can also be used. We usually use the tympanic membrane and uh, I mean if we are struggling with the axillary, of course our sisters, uh, they are not different from the sisters in LHMC or RM or other hospitals, they also refer to the axillary one. But if we have an axillary temperature of 37, I am not worried. Uh, the problem comes if the temperature is 32. You know, in those cases, you need to be doubly sure. So what we tell them is, uh, all the patients who are in this ICU and you know, uh, getting ready for the organ donation uh, activities, so we start the uh, the warm saline. You know, the, that is the first and the most important thing. You give them the gamer blanket and you start warming up the patient. And uh, usually it takes around three to four hours. And uh, within that time, we are able to uh, get all the parameters in place. We also have to wait for all the reports to come back to us. I mean, if you have a patient with a urea of 300 plus and ALP, ALP of 2000 plus, I just don't want to do anything. Why should I do make my efforts when only the corneas are going to be harvested? So you need to look at all the lab parameters. See, it's a uh, kind of a decision which you have to, uh, you have to look at multiple parameters. How is the patient's biochemistry? How are the patient's other things? Wait before you, whether the patient is in active infection or not. Then only you should do this test. If the lungs are totally knocked out, I mean, uh, naturally, I will not even think of doing an apnea test. I'll straight away go for either ECMO backed up apnea test or uh, ancillary test. So if your peripheral temperature, if your peripheral temperature is coming out to be 37, then what is the cause for worry? Yes. There is no column for the temperature there, but you have to mention that the patient uh, is 
clinically temperature is normal to perform the column is actually for the test if you look at the test why don't we uh, share the uh, this thing form 8 form 10 and form 7 you know with the 8 and 10 are the most important forms so they will see what are the things to be tick marked okay any any doubts on the apnea test anybody yes please this is something which i don't do i don't do the bait circuit because uh, you are uh, you are, you can wait for some time until the patient stabilizes and then do it again if the lungs are normal uh, you know it all depends on the critical care guy who is along with you to help you out on that situation with the bait circuit dr rahul pandit who mentioned that so he is a critical care expert so for him it's easy not it's not easy for the rest of us so yeah to answer that question uh, many centers in the world i have i have visited uh they do apnea test not by disconnection of the ventilator they do the apnea test with the patient on cpap but the unfortunate thing with most of the cpap ventilators which are available in our country all the ventilators should be checked they go into the backup mode okay after 20 seconds 30 seconds they will go in the backup mode and the patient will be shifted back from cpap to the simb you understand if the backup mode can be turned off there are trigger ventilators available i myself uh, tested it initially i was recently there So if the if the when if you can turn off that backup mode in that CPAP, then you can do the test with the CPAP mode. Any other questions? So uh, see uh, what we do at trauma center is uh, just for the purpose of you know just to see how much is the rise. We do it at three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, and ten minutes. and uh, the machine is there in the icu itself but you can actually do it at 8 minutes itself as a first as you can do a baseline and you do a second one at 8 minutes okay no. so yeah, if you document you have to the law stipulates that it should be disconnected when later disconnected should be for 10 minutes so no. the yeah even by the if the seventh minute ab is saying that the pco to the result from by 20 minutes from the baseline or just touch 60 minutes Of, uh, okay. then you cannot stop the apnea test you have to continue for full 10 minutes so is the indian law is talking about is a word brain that project which has come up now which talks about documenting a rise of more than 60 or more than 20 irrespective of the time if you get it within 5 minutes you can reconnect the patient to the ventilator people are also talking about the need for uh, why do why do we want to do a two apnea test just one apnea test should be enough so i was recently in emirates and uh, there they do the second apnea test after 30 minutes They don't wait for six hours because each passing minute is very crucial. Okay, have you understood everything? Can you demonstrate uh, how will you do the apnea test? All this while you were standing like a mute spectator, as if I am not going to ask you any questions. We being professors, we keep on asking questions. Just document everything. There is a uh, so-called uh, a suspected brain dead person lying with you, and uh, we want you to uh, conduct the brain stem reflexes and the apnea test. How will you go about it? All yours. Start from head to toe. So first, you check for the people in your chair. Um, swing three times at the top, and uh, rule out talking about the other side. So if it is on one side, then the second test is the cardiac test with a whisk of cotton, just at the end of the head. Then congenital test. Then you go below gag with it. With the tongue depressor between the tongue, and then the posterior pharyngeal wall is stimulated on both the sides. Then the cough reflex. So I have a doubt in this. You said that twenty-four centimeters you can count, but there are some patients. You look at the size of the where the endotracheal tube is like. Look at the vocal cord. So basically, the idea is wherever the tip of the endotracheal tube is there, you have to go one centimeter beyond that. That's it. Yes. No, 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 no. One centimeter beyond the expected tip. Yeah. Um, after that, the pain stimulates. No, no, no. You have to look for the dull side movement okay. which you missed out, and you will hold the endotracheal tube in the hand when you are moving the first gentleman from the two okay. sides. Okay. You should roll out the cervical spine injury prior. Huh? Roll out the cervical spine injury, and then um, whichever side the head is moving, the eye should be fixed to the opposite side. So there should not be any movement of the eye. Straight. Uh, Yeah. So doll's eye movement, like a doll, the movements of the eyes are not happening. You know, when you are moving the doll, the movements are not happening. 
cold caloric response cold caloric response so when you pass cold water into the earth rule out entire thing here and then uh, it moves the opposite side then cold is cold is actually see the nystagmus is to the opposite side but the corrective movement is the same side you are looking for the eye movement you are not looking for the nystagmus so the eye movement will be on the same side okay you have to raise the head by 30 degrees when you raise the head by 30 degrees i forgot to tell because i could not move this uh, gentleman but yes he is right you have to make it 30 degrees up before do the cold calorie excellent then the motor response okay okay and central stimuli where will you give no okay no problem no. super orbital temporomandibular joint serious spinal okay and these are the places you give and pencil nail bed or four limbs correct okay. so then you will check for all the prerequisites what is the blood pressure what is the temperature how is the biochemistry and how is the baseline abg if everything is in place you will ask for one more friend of yours who is in the icu to be there with you and in nursing staff to to take out the samples and to send and then you will do the apnea test so can you describe how will you do the apnea test okay Okay, right now the systolic is 110 by 16, 110 by 60. The saturation is 98, which is good. The respiratory rate, uh, if the patient is on, uh, I think, SIMB ventilated support as of now, and the patient is afebrile, temperature is 36.1. So, can we do the apnea test? Okay, so we do the apnea test. So, what will you do? Okay, okay. So the artery line has to be there before because you have to do a ABG uh, for the patient. So, so all these patients, brain-dead patients, they should have a arterial line and a central line in place. It may look like wastage of so much of health resources, but at the end of the day, you are doing it to save six to eight lives. Uh. So central line and arterial line should be in place for all patients wherein you are, you are contemplating brainstem death certification and further. Okay. Then? So first you will uh, disconnect the patient, you will put in the catheter at, and give oxygen at minimum at a rate of 6 liters per minute. Pre, first we have pre-oxygenated for minimum of 10 minutes by 100% oxygen when the patient is on the ventilator support. Then you disconnect the ventilator, you put in a, a, a oxygen insufflation catheter which should not be more than one third the width of the endotechial tube. Okay, you put it inside run it at a rate of 6 liters per minute and then you wait but draw, draw a sample at 3 minutes, 5 minutes, 8 minutes and the report usually comes in less than 30 seconds because the machine is there in your ICU and itself okay and in the meanwhile you keep on looking at the patient's chest movement I usually keep a hand on the patient's chest okay and then I keep looking like this so you keep a hand on the patient's chest and there is one more person who is observing you and look for what is happening on the monitor and uh, before doing the apnea test as I said I always uh, do some amount of cheating, which is like I, I, I kind of give some small baby bonus of no red, 0.5 ml to 1 ml, so that my BP is around 130 to 140 systolic, so that even if it crashes, the BP will crash by 10, 20, 30. It will not crash to less than 85 to 90. So you have to just increase, you increase the oxygenation, you increase the blood pressure, okay, and uh, other things are going on in the patient. Yeah, so if, the, if the, there's a fall in the blood pressure arrhythmia, then you abort the test. Otherwise, you wait for 8 to 10 minutes, No, nothing happening, you re don't forget to reconnect the patient to the ventilator. Once the apnea test is done, don't just wash off your hands and disappear. Huh? You have to reconnect the patient back to the ventilator. And and please, please, as Dr. Ishwar is the biggest proponent of one philosophy, that you have to document. Whatever you're doing, you have to document. Uh, would you like to tell a story of the uh, when two signatures were done and what happened? So, actually, Kerala's uh, organ donation, uh, brain death certification process was hauled through the High Court of Kerala. So, uh, you know, you know, we went through a torrent, uh, you know, that time because uh, we were questioned by the High Court on the process of our brain death certification. And one of the doctors who filed a public investigation against the process came up with a you know, copy of the brain death certification papers, which showed only two signatures. That is the neurologist as well as a critical care expert, the treating doctor. The other two, the expert from the panel as well as the medical superman had not signed it at all. Now, this gentleman went one step further. 
he went with a pen camera to the office of the medical superintendent of the hospital where this certification took place and asked him, do you perform this brain death certification? The man had a very stock answer and that is, no, no, my, I sent my resident to do it. So the court did not like that at all. So make sure that before you leave the ICU, all the papers should have been filled up and the signatures should be there and properly in its place. If not, you know, 10 years from now, you know, you will be asked for these questions in the, in the court of law. Uh, another thing that has happened in Kerala is that all the brainstem certifications are subjected to audit by the local SOTO. So, which means that every year, whatever signatures that you've done will be audited by another agency, which will find out the mistakes that you have done and help you to correct them. So it is important to avoid such, uh, you know, uh, you know what you call uh, omissions in our certification process, so that our certification is credible, and will, even if it is subject to any form of scrutiny, judicial or otherwise, it will stand the test of its time. But Ishwar, do I need to be very scared? You know, when you are telling me all this thing, I am so scared that I'll be pulled by the law. What will happen to me? I mean, do I need to be scared? Having done over 100 the brain death certifications, I must confess that the first few occasions when I did it, I was a little apprehensive whether I was doing the right thing or not. And there are occasions when, you know, I didn't know Deepak at that time that he was also doing it. There was nobody to call up and find out what was happening. But fortunately, we have now a wealth of wisdom from our experience from India is what to do when you are running your problem. You don't, you know, the fact that it is a national law, it protects you. The certification process is protected by the law of the land. So you don't have to worry on that one. Now, if you perform an omission, that is when you know you have to be very careful. You, should, you have to document what you do. We are just uh, asking you to be very meticulous in your documentation. We are not asking you to be an, uh, have any kind of a fear of but what you are doing is it's all legal. It's a law. As for the Indian law, you are bound to your. It is mandatory for ICU personnel to declare brain death and to talk to the family on the possible need of organ donation. Dr. Sareem, you wanted to come. Did you have, do you have any questions in, uh, to ask or anything from you? Any suggestions, tips, guidance? Good. Anybody else? All right. I will ask on their behalf. If this patient, um, madam, has intubated with rocuronium and she has put the patient on fentanyl, and patient is M1, we had all the other criteria. What do you suggest us to do? How long to wait? Whether to stop the sedation? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, the moment a patient who is M1 with the irreversible damage comes to the ICU, so we stop all their drugs, metazolam, fentanyl, the next sense. And then, if the patient was on infusion or was the patient receiving high doses, if the patient is in infusion, when you stop, you have to wait for five half lives. And uh, so many times we don't know. We have to ask our anesthesia colleagues what is the half life of this particular drug, and then we have to wait for five passes. You know, let's say uh, some some drugs half life is around 45 minutes. You wait for around four to five hours before you actually do the test. Okay. So no questions. I hope some of you will be making an attempt. I think with this workshop, even if 10% uh, of you start doing the test, uh, our job is done. Thank you so much. If you want uh, to feel the mannequin, it's a 3G simulator. It's a very special mannequin actually. Uh, unfortunately, because of the Wi-Fi issues, uh, we could not uh, show the live movement in the mannequin. But in this uh, 3G simulator, you can palpate. Actually, right now, you can palpate the chest movement. You can uh, make the pupils contract and uh, dilate. You can create the eye, uh, the, the I, the, the corneal reflex, you can feel the pulsations, you can create uh, seizures. So whatever you want, you can do and you can play around with all those parameters as a learning exercise. You know, uh, what should be the uh, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory, other parameters. So it's a beautiful software and we are using it for teaching purpose uh, for this. Sorry. Yeah, if you want to come, um, I mean, you can just feel the cadaver. Otherwise, I think it's all self explanatory. We saw it on the stage. It will be fine. Okay, thank you.
अरे आप सब लोग तो वहीं बैठे हुए आ जाइए आप कम 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 How many are from Harding? What are you waiting there? Come here, come here. Don't you guys attend Splash? Come on the stage, all of you. Ah, people are so resistant. They are still sitting. Come It's more. No, close and exit doors. <laughs> exit door needs to be closed. Please come. चलिए चलिए सब आ जाइए. Please pass. No, no, the exit door is closed. I think they do not want uh, photographs. Anyways, whatever they want. हाँ हटा दे खत्म हाँ अरे वो देखो ना डेस्कटॉप पे बनाए तो मैंने एक अकाउंट आईटी वो करके है क्या अगर अगर डेस्कटॉप पे नहीं होगा तो डी में फोल्डर है फोल्डर है एक पे फोल्डर मैंने अकाउंट का बनाया था अच्छा और नहीं है कोई मेरे मेरे पीसी पे मत जाओ और जो जिस पे तुम बैठी हो वो अलग पीसी बस और कोई फोल्डर नहीं हाँ डी ड्राइव खोलो डी ड्राइव में होगा फिर आशीष शर्मा करके होगा हाँ उसमें देखो एक अकाउंट का अलग बना रखा है हाँ उसमें देख लो उसमें है हाँ बजट वाले में देख लो ठीक है देखो एक उसमें बजट का है सब लोग आ जाएं इधर जस्ट सो मच स्पेस है यहाँ पे आप देख लेंगे यहाँ पे आप देख लेंगे इतने एक वन रो है तीन लोगों क्या कर रहे हैं एक दो तीन चार पांच छह कम कम Thank you so Thank much. You. Just a minute, sir. <laughs> This goes into our faculty group in the evening. And then use Facebook for the. <laughs> Thank you. 